historical space or an art space and getting that one straight passive voice that just tells you about the complete history of the world. And it's so dull because there's never any room for emotion and nuance and complexities. Every single object in one of those collections has its own messy biography. That was made in a context and moved from that context. We as individuals are also bringing our own experiences and perception there on the surface of that object. That's a collision. It's a contact zone in a very basic sense. And it's a space where we have to be prepared to deal with emotion and deal with the, the pain and the violence that comes with that. When I talk about the idea of uncomfortable, obviously there's a flip side to that, which is that for some people who come on my tours, I've had people tell me that hearing these stories is one of the first times they've actually felt heard and comfortable in a museum space. And being able to also say, hey, there are lots of narratives here. You maybe didn't feel represented before, but we can make room for you to be part of the conversation and engage with people sharing their own stories and their own experiences. That's a really important part of the story. They're supposed to be conversational, so not just been talking to people for an hour, which is really lucky for everyone involved. Um, but the whole idea is that everyone can be part of a conversational space. I don't like to call it a safe space because that has a lot of baggage with it. Um, but I do address my tours as an empathetic space. And the idea is that as long as you are fundamentally respectful of everyone else in the group, you are considerate of their basic humanity and their rights and their self and their boundaries and you respect that, we can have some quite difficult conversations. That's the whole goal of all of this. I'm just going to read you a very short quote from the uh, Whitby Gazette in the UK. When I first started doing my tours, I kind of, I was totally under the radar and the museums didn't know about me. I'm still outside of the institutions, we don't officially work together, but unfortunately, or fortunately, because it gets me to do things like this, I've had a bit of press attention, including from the local newspaper in Whitby, which some of you may know, was the hometown of Captain Cook. <laughs> Charles Forgan from Whitby's Captain Cook Museum insists the invader tag is an unfair one for Cook. He said, full marks to Miss Proctor for initiative. We should always acknowledge the subsequent effects of British migration on native populations. <laughs> However, it is inappropriate to apply the term invader to Captain Cook because it evokes the hostility, violence, and conquest of William the Conqueror, Napoleon, Hitler, and many others. He added, Cook's voyages were voyages of scientific investigation to observe the transit of Venus and to find the great southern continent. His orders were to do this peacefully and make friends where he could. So, this is a bigger context of how museums tell stories and what stories get privileged in those spaces. Some of you may have marked on the 14th of February the death of Captain Cook, which is a moment that's so heavily mythologized and so fantasized about in British culture as this kind of like great heroic defeat. And when I say British culture in this context, I am actually including my Australia because, and so much of my work is dealing with this, of the way that these fantasies are created and then brought to Australia by the British colonists, by the British invaders. These are concepts that pre-exist in the Northern Hemisphere, the whole fantasy of Australia is shaped in London before anyone even gets on boat. So, with that in mind, we have to be really conscious of the way that museums in the UK are holding objects that do not belong to them, and in doing that, they are deliberately erasing the stories that they cannot face about their own complicity in those processes. This whole Captain Cook thing, especially in regard to Whitby, um, is just a huge process of paranoia and anxiety and a reluctance to sit with the discomfort and recognize that sometimes it has to be a little awkward and it has to be a little bit painful before you'll make any progress in understanding yourself. When I do my tools, my goal isn't to, you know, be... I, I can be a bit aggressive. Um, my goal isn't to make anyone feel guilty. My goal is to make people come out of that space with a bit of more self-awareness than they walked in with. I don't want anyone to feel guilt or regret or remorse because I don't think that gets anything done. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, that whole thing of like, oh, let's just feel really guilty about our past is used as a way of avoiding the actual work that needs to be done in the present. And so I don't want anyone to feel guilty. I just want them to come out with a little bit of self-awareness 
to talk about their own positionality within this. I am a white Australian who now lives in the UK. I was born on unceded and occupied Gadigal land in what is now Sydney. So I was told when I was a kid that my ancestors came to South Australia and cleared the land, which is a nice euphemism because it covers both trees and people. And so I'm entangled within this. Everyone in this room is entangled with colonialism in some way, shape, or form. If you're aware of it, that is, you know, a good first step. If you're not aware of it, and if you're not living with it in every day and experiencing it in everything that you do, that means that you're in a privileged enough position that you don't think about it. It doesn't mean you're excluded from that situation. I feel like I'm just saying a lot of words, and I would love to talk to anyone about how we tell these stories in museums afterwards, but just to give you a kind of brief introduction to what I do, and then move on to other people that are more interesting.